Um, okay, I'm looking at the Word version to see if I can replicate what you're doing. We have a new guest. Let's see. Do you want to share your screen? Do you have the application up, the Word doc? Nicole, maybe. I had the wrong one up, so let me get the right one. Hi, Cassandra. Welcome. Hi, thank you. We just started. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Tell us who you are and what organization you're with. Sure. My name is Cassie and I work with uh, Monarch Services. Hey, welcome. We've got um, several people here from um, the Recovery Cafe. And then, and Deb Bone is here, um, formerly with Cabrillo and the Stroke Center and the nursing program, and now is um, representing one of the nonprofits as a grant writer. So we've got my service here. agency. I'm happy to say the name. Um, so we've got um, a discussion started about the the medium and large tier RFPs, and just wondered, have you had a chance to look at these at all yet, Cassie, or? Um, or log into reviewer, the online platform that's going to be how these applications get submitted? Very briefly. I looked over it at a team meeting, so I did it with yeah. the larger group. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So we think at this point in time, that's pretty much where people are just kind of assembling their ideas and trying to think about which tier is appropriate, which is great. We can talk through some of that today too. And Deb was mentioning that she was unable to get word counts so let's see, um, on the Word doc. So you, there is within review, there is, you can like shade something like is happening right now. Yeah, like that. Yeah, so, so what happened when I opened it was that all of the stuff on the ribbon at the top was grayed out and I couldn't access it. Hmm. And I don't know what That's I- That's usually a version issue, right? Um, oh, maybe my computer is older, that the version of Word that I'm using is too old. Do you know what version you're using? Oh, it's very old. Very it's old, probably, okay. Um, 10 years old at least. I, I, I actually think that might be a question for HSD about whether we can share the- Unprotected. I think it has to do with the, the document being protected. Oh, you're right. You're right. Which I think HSD tried thinking it would make it easier for people to just <laughs> draft things in the document, but it it does make it harder to. I'd forgotten that we have a different version. My apologies. Um, do you want me to show you what I have? I mean, yeah, sure. I think. Do I hit share screen first, or do I have to open the doc first? Get confused. It's, go ahead and open the doc just so you can make sure you get to it instead right. of other things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I should be able to do it pretty easily once I get to my desktop, which is very. I'll ask you for the, an application or program, maybe, and, or you might just visually see it as open. Meanwhile, um, we'll put a link to a Google Doc, a real Google Doc, in the um, in the chat and. If you are thinking about a question you already have or one that's been um, raised by this part of the discussion or any other, that's one way we can collect questions and start responding to them. We can also collect them in the chat. Um, those of you who were on a prior call may know that um, we're here to talk about some of the core uh, framework tools and concepts and how those might apply to the RFP and help you with that, among other things. But if there are questions, like this one is veering into about the, um, the reviewer platform, the format of the application, um, some of the process parts of it, those are probably more appropriate for the human services department team. And just uh, to, to emphasize again, um, Nicole and I are not part of any part of the reviewing or scoring process. We don't um, have the ability to comment on that and um, some of it hasn't been developed yet, we do uh, want to try to help. So we want to, uh, our goal is to help everyone have access to these tools that we think will strengthen applications for this, as well as other types of funding and other planning tasks. Um, we also have training, additional training on the tools that dives in a little more uh, next week and in January. 
and we have um, opportunities to sign up for one-on-one -on -one TA that you may choose to do uh, a little later in the process when you have more specific questions or you're welcome to do it sooner if that would be helpful to you. But that is uh, one TA session per application. So um, just consider that when you're signing up. And then we have um, these kinds of group sessions where you can learn from us if possible and also from each other. So that's, that's the lineup. Okay, so Deb. Yeah, I don't know if, I, if it's showing or not. Is it it's showing? It's showing that you pick the large, yeah. And then I had, there's some paragraphs that I started. Okay, let's with. see if you can highlight that paragraph, the building over X years, yeah. And then. Um, I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to touch to get it. Cause if I went up to the top, see how it's all grayed out? Mm. None of these are available to me. So I'm, like, I'm on a Mac, so I have a slightly different menu. I'm on a Mac too. You don't have a tools up to be top? You got a review. This is all that is showing. In yeah. If you click between. on the menu that says review. Okay. See how the, this is where it's supposed to be. Yeah. And it's all grayed out. Yeah, I think it, because it's protected. I'm going to ask HSD right now if we can share the unprotected box. Okay. Great, thank you. So I'll sign out and you guys can do your own chair. Yeah, yep. Okay, cool. Anyway, thanks for uh, addressing that one because I'm not the only that's person who's going to be bothered by that, I'm sure. Not at all, and I would be too. I mean, that, that's the whole point of having the documents that way so that people could prep their answers before getting into the right. portal and, and getting frustrated when things are the wrong word count or character count for the space. That's the biggest allotted. juggle. The biggest yeah. juggle of this whole process is fitting it into the boxes. Yep. Well, yep. there's many challenges, but that's one of them. That's one of them. For the grant writer, that's a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cassie, in your quick review, did you have any questions about the um, the things that are being asked for in the application or? I don't think I have any specific questions that have come to mind right now. I'm sure that I will have something pop up okay. um, as we go through. So the, the small, medium, large and targeted impact um, applications have different levels of detail, but they cover some similar ground. So, um, for example, the, the medium one might ask you for up to three outcomes to be described um, with some detail, whereas the large one, you can add more and you could have up to eight. So the whole idea is that the more funding that you're asking for, in all likelihood, the more complexity, the more dimensions, the more layers there are to your proposal and to what you're um, planning to implement, and therefore there's more detail to offer and more detail to ask for. And then all the way up to the, the targeted impact one is, um, is the most, has the most uh, requests for information and complexity. And then the other piece is that um, you, you are deciding whether or not you're doing something with others. And so if that's the case and you have a joint budget, you might be asked to do um, a different budget form. So they're just decisions as you go through them. Um, you, you will be, the categories are the same. You're describing the need, the response that you might have, why you think your approach will work, um, what capacity your organization has to bring to bear, what kinds of things, uh, what kinds of uh, people you're working with as uh, what, the, what, who you're providing services to. So what can you tell us about them? Um, what are the different um, equity dimensions of what you're working on? Um, and how you're going to do what you propose to do. So those are the, the, as I mentioned, the same kinds of questions. They're just, some of them have a little more detail as you increase in size, but the medium and large are very similar. So uh, this morning we were discussing the uh, the outcome goals and that, that on the small 
proposal, you there, a, a minimum of one, but you could put in two goals. So um, you just now you mentioned the you can go up to eight in in the other. What is the what are the minimum number of goals for the medium and large? I think it's still one. Really? Okay. And then this morning we talked about that you would put the goal as your goal for the first year. And then if there were additional goals or additional, you know, higher numbers, whatever, for years two and three, you, you have, the, it's, so that is that the same for the medium and large that you put it in for the first year? And then the, a follow-up question, if you want to add um, additional goals or, or higher numbers for the years two and three. Right. Yep, I'm just looking that up so I can show you that page on the medium. So identify up to three specific measurable outcomes. And there's the space to do that. And then if it's anticipated that progress on the measurable outcomes will be different in years two and three, describe that. Very good, thank you. So up to three, but still no, just the minimum one. I, I'm that's not great. seeing one. Um, hmm. Nicole, am I missing something? No, I think that's right. Um, and I think the reason for that is, again, to provide latitude to the applicants to frame their work. So you might have a very tight specific outcome or a broader outcome, and it's up to you to explain to the reviewers how you are, how and why you are doing that. It's still, if we were going for a medium or large, it might be it might be better to express that you know we the multiple goals might might be um, or it, it would be more advantageous to a reviewer, but or, or, or that's something you can't really answer because that's kind of up to them as they review it. It's up to them as they review it, and it, you know, can so much depends on what is being proposed and how the case is being made. I mean it. It stands to reason that if um, that, I mean, outcomes can be written with different scale and scope. So you probably wouldn't want to be asking for from any funder for a huge, a larger size of funding in the, in the scheme of things for a very tight, narrow outcome. The sort of the um, the calculation of, if you think about these funds trying to have the greatest impact possible, um, that's why we talked about starting with something like a theory of change and logic model and really seeing where you think you can be most effective and using that as the basis for designing your, your pitch and your program. And it may be that that leads you towards a um, a narrower goal or outcome and a more defined scope, or it may be that it's more ambitious. And it's just really hard to say until you start thinking about what it is that you want to do. And also, I would say there, there is the organizational capacity piece of this. And so I was reading something the other day about capability not being the same as capacity. So Theoretically, everybody's talented, passionate, committed, dedicated. You're capable of doing these things, but is there actually bandwidth and capacity to do things, even if you add some funding? Um, is it possible to do it well and effectively? And so those are those are real considerations. Maybe it's maybe you can make a stronger case for doing something. This is totally hypothetical for not to any of the organizations in this room. Maybe someone could make a stronger case for doing something narrower and more limited that fits, that's a better fit with their current capacity um, than doing something more extensive. One additional thought about that, and again, I'm thinking back to some of the some of the issues or or things that came up in the last round of core funding. Um, where it was 
think there was a tendency for a lot of applicants to feel like, oh, I've got to put everything in because I'm not really sure what's going <laughs> to increase our chance of getting funding. So I'm just going to like cover my bases and put everything in. Um, and that didn't necessarily make for a more meaningful and clear proposal. So I think that's, you know, that's a lot about what Nicole is describing. And like if you, depending on the program, like if you have a cluster of outcomes that are very similar, they're just kind of like slight nuances of, of a same thing, then that might be a good time just, you know, general program planning to think through, okay, of those, like what, what one might feel the strongest in terms of, you know, you feel most confident in the measurement tool and the kinds of outcomes, again, based on some of the things you shared earlier about the recovery cafe network and that other sites have history of outcomes like based looking at some of that data is there a particular outcome that really stands out as ooh that's consistent in terms of you know producing um changes um you know the tool itself has been tested and vetted and and you know you can use it with a lot of confidence um so it might mean that you're still collecting data just for your own program purposes, you know, that a, a particular survey or a set of surveys might actually be giving you data on multiple outcomes. And if they're all kind of in the same family of, you know, what they're measuring, that might be a case where you don't necessarily have to include all of those in your proposal. It may not necessarily, you know, may not actually strengthen your proposal. It's a, that's, kind of one of those layers of discussion to have. Thanks, Nicole. And Serge, thank you for the information in the chat about how you had a work around there. Yeah, I'm always doing my life as workarounds. Uh -huh. um, and, but I do everything on an iPad um, and they're coming closer, but they're not everything. So the only ways I was able to do counts is by like what you were doing, going up to review and doing counts um, in a section by section moment, whether that was Google Docs or the limited permissions that we had on Word. Okay. And Nicole's put out a request to see if we can get you all an, an unprotected version, which would solve all that as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Thanks for bringing that to our attention, Deborah. Yeah. So I brought a specific question that I was hoping to get some feedback go for. Go for it. Go into that. Yes. The Family Service Agency has six different components. All of the projects are about mental health, different aspects of mental health and support, but they're distinct. But, and in the past, we've put in applications for the different components as separate programs. Over the last five years, the programs have gotten a lot more merged. There's been a lot more coordination across programs. And David and I are thinking that perhaps we're better off presenting it as one entity, which it is, except because there's history there. There was one program and then Family Service Agency absorbed a couple of other programs in over time. And those have now been kind of integrated in a lot more. COVID had something to do with that because there was a lot of changes that had to happen. Anyway, so we're looking at a large because if you took all six of the small ones and put them together into a large, you know, we're kind of looking at the same amount, but we're trying to, at least I'm trying to imagine how to best portray our goals and our outcomes when the different components classically have had different verbiage around what they do. And there is some pretty big distinctions, even though there's also common threads. So any thoughts that you might have, I don't know if you want more details. I mean, I could tell you what the six programs are about. They all have to do with mental health. I'm thinking resilience is what we're trying to go for in all six of the programs. And I'm even thinking, David's out of town, so we aren't talking, but when he gets home, my idea is project resilience. That's maybe a name, we've never done that, but um, to present everything that we do in the context of creating more resilient people in our community. We know that COVID along with lots of other factors has really had an impact in the negative way on people's ability to cope. So I don't know if that sounds like a direction that can work. You know, we've got counseling, general counseling, family, adult, 
We've got peer counseling for seniors. We've got a visitor support program for um, seniors in nursing homes, which is a lot about mental family mental support and dealing with isolation. We've got woman care, which is women with cancer. We've got suicide prevention, which is a phone consultation for people. Call, it's a call-in service. And then survivor's healing, which is support for survivors of childhood sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse. So each of those are ways of helping to support people to gain resilience. And they're pretty distinct. So we were kind of thinking, well, if we ask for large with the eight different outcomes, can we do one for each of the different programs or should we try to create composite outcomes that go across those programs? Deb, I think that those questions are really good guiding questions for looking at a logic model theory of change exercise mm -hmm. with David and others. Mm -hmm. Um, because there might be some of those streams that you mentioned or programs mm -hmm. that lend themselves to being clustered together a bit mm -hmm. versus others, either by, mm -hmm. by age. That's already by, true. Yeah. 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 Yep. And so you may not be making a choice between one and eight. Right. Right. Um, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then You've mentioned a number of things that have changed. So COVID, um, the way that these programs operate, their, their scope. So things that were true five years ago or 10 years ago about the programs and their outcomes and the way that they relate to each other and to the people they're serving, sounds like it's worth a refresh anyway. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, this can be, um, you can call it whatever you'd like, but it sounds like it's a, a planning um, refresh mm -hmm. um, update kind of scenario where mm -hmm. you where it's just due and maybe overdue for a fresh look at how these things fit together, how they serve a common purpose or different purposes, mm -hmm. where there might be some synergies of training, staffing, volunteers. This is exactly what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, so that would be my initial suggestion mm -hmm. and not even related to the RFP. Just, mm -hmm. you know, start with uh, thinking through um, what, what the implications are for your organization mm -hmm. and looking ahead and then great. see what parts of it um, are RFP friendly. Mm -hmm. And it may or may not be all of it. So I, I just um, would urge you not to think about this as a monolithic clump of programs that have to be pitched together or not or separately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thanks. Nicole, anything to add? Um, just one clarification that for the large applications, it's uh, up to five outcomes, and then it's the targeted impact that kind of Uber collective impact um, proposal where you can oh it is just yeah. up to eight. Oh, okay. And so that that might help just with the thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I totally agree with what Nicole just said about going through the logic model and theory of change exercise mm -hmm. because it might come down to like in the applications where you're describing the community challenges that your proposal seeks to address. Mm -hmm. If you're finding that you really need to be able to describe the community challenges differently. Mm -hmm. because of the populations or where it asks, you know, it's like the dimensions of equity that mm -hmm. you're most focused on or concerned about. Like if, if that's really different from, you know, from one mm -hmm. population that you're serving in a program from another, mm -hmm. that would definitely make sense to then, you know, think about preparing separate applications with separate outcomes. If you find that you're describing the populations and the challenges and the services in a very similar way, even though it's historically been, you know, different programs, mm -hmm. then that would really lend itself to, okay, reimagining, rethinking how you describe that program or project as a more consolidated one that mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, this um, is really helpful because yeah. yeah, the precedent was one thing and now we're, we're contemplating how to do this different thing and yet, you know, don't want to make it not work. <laughs> Right, right. And, and obviously a lot of work has gone on, certainly in terms of we consolidated how we're recruiting volunteers. And I don't want to take everybody's time, but anyway, just this is helpful. It'll definitely give me something to think about. Our, our operating assumption is that all questions are helpful to everyone one way or the other. So don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. Seeing some nodding there. Um, Can I ask a different question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so I, on the idea that no agency is going to get t more than 25% of the total amount, if I was to collaborate with some large agency that might go over somewhere near 25%, our collaborated project, what's the percentage of our collaborated project that goes towards them getting closer to 25% or not? Would 100% of our project go towards them going over 25 or 50-50 or how might that work? Complicated, like specific complicated question, which maybe you can't answer. I'm not sure, but I thought, I, I thought that in those targeted impact budgets, when each partner has a specific amount, that that's what's operative. Thank you, Nicole. Is that what you're asking? The research. research? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if it's a collaborative proposal, you'll have the proposal would have to include specific information in the budget about how much is for agency X, how much is for agency Y. So that perfect. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for finding that. I should have found yeah. that myself. Yeah, no, that's okay. There's a lot of information in here, so it's good that you asked. <laughs> I have a question about the application as I'm going through it. And it this so might just be Jesse. a different version that I'm looking at. Is the one that we have the exact same one that we'll be submitting into, or is this a breakdown of what it will? Uh, I, I what, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the medium application. Um, yeah. I'm just not sure if the downloadable one on the website, is that the exact same one that we'll be submitting or is this sort of a template for us to kind of plug and work in? The, um, the actual application will have to be submitted through an online portal right. reviewer. And so you will have to cut and paste okay. from whatever you're working in, unless you're working directly in reviewer which some people may do, it's, it's a little bit constrained just because you have to, in review or you have to fill in a section before moving on to the next one. And a lot of, as you can see with a lot of this work, it's, it doesn't work that way. Uh -huh. um, so for example, you might wanna flesh out your whole proposal before you do the three sentence summary that's one of the first things it's asked for, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can always go change things. It's not that it's cast in stone, but um, I, I personally would, do it offline and then submit, but um, but that's why. But it is exactly the same. Okay. So the questions are the same. The order is the same. The drop downs are the same. Um, the the whole idea was to make it easier. Although you know, we have we have a couple little glitches that we're unearthing as people start working with these documents. But I'm sure that's. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be complications that come up yeah. when you're dealing with something of this size and magnitude. Exactly. And, um, so, and it's the first time that the county has done this as an online application in, you know, using a, a portal like this. So, um, so we're all just trying to have expectations of the, the sooner that people can play with reviewer a little bit and log in, like somebody this morning had some login issues that we've forwarded. Up, up the uh, ticket chain. Um, but the sooner that people can log in and get a, just get find their way around um, inside reviewer, that's great. There will be another reviewer training um, in January. And um, 
yeah, that's but that's the idea to have these two parallel things. But the the actual hitting the send button, submitting the application before the due date has to happen through through reviewer. Okay, so then I do then have this question. Um, so when it's asking you to identify the primary um, area of impact that the proposal addresses, if I have we have a project that we're contemplating that fits directly and squarely within an, a safe and just communities and um, a thriving families and a health and wellness. Um, do we are, You are not alone. Right? Yeah. So it, I'm sure that's why I'm yeah, asking. This, this is such a struggle because um, we've always thought of and talked about and trained on the core conditions being interconnected. Of course. To each other. And this format didn't quite allow for that concept to be reflected in the drop down. So that's why there's an ask for a primary core condition or service area. And then you can explain more about the dimensions for others in the text. So we're just going to have to pick one. That's fine. I just didn't know if the application was really sort of coaching you into really focusing on the one or if it was contemplating it as more integrated and really just kind of by virtue of the platform. Yes, I'm, I don't think it's coaching you into one. It's it's more um, to understand the the universe of applications where they're mainly you know how how are they distributed, what, what kinds of reviewers um, need to be lined up. If the if there's a huge tilt in one direction or another, and, and that needs to be revisited, there is a board of supervisors meeting in March where that would come up. We're not anticipating that. Um, we feel like we have a sense of the diversity of applicants um, and, and interested parties from these trainings and from participation in meetings over the summer, but it could happen. And so there is a, a plan for you know, how, to, how to deal with that if it happens. But really it is, um, it is to give you a sense of, to give the reviewers and the, and the funder a sense of where people see their primary connection but but please do play up any any other connections to core conditions um the the holistic approach that Serge talked about earlier today the um that's very much part of this model and it's in um it's i wouldn't want anyone to walk away from this thinking that they're being coached or forced to to disregard their connections to other core conditions or service partners um, because of the way that the, that reviewers set up. Okay. Was that a repeat question? Apologies. That was a few minutes. No, no, we've, we've had, we've had several of these meetings earlier today okay. for other tiers. Yeah, not a repeat question. And, and even if it were, that's fine. People are tuning in and out and um, repetition is good in this context and many others as well. Um, other questions? Deb, go ahead. If someone else has one, please go. I'm just wanting to use the time. I would love to have you talk a little bit more about the equity, inequity definitions, populations. It seems like they're, it's pretty broad what those opportunities are. And yet, you know, there seems to be also some clarity about racial inequities being primary. I'd like to hear how that's being thought about. Okay, um, we think of these as dimensions of equity and um, you're encouraged if you have a different way of thinking about equity to talk about that. And there's even another category for the drop-down menu. In terms of racial equity, we always talk about that as being an explicit but not exclusive focus of the equity work. And so um, there are opportunities to, to address that as well, especially in the targeted impact, um, the, the kind of the jumbo one. <laughs> um, and then we also think about the equity dimensions in terms of both process and outcome. And so a lot of this is um, not necessarily related to scoring, because different organizations are at different points on this journey. It's really to um, try to bring forth um, both awareness and understanding of what people are doing in, in this regard um, in, within their organization. So you have a lot of latitude to describe 
the efforts that you're engaged in as an organization and where you see that going next for your organization. So I'm accustomed to thinking of the definition of race as being problematic, particularly in our area, because it's often multicultural and it's, I, I'm, we don't have a lot of African-American people, which in America is kind of the poster child for race. Um, I'm wondering how second language non-English speakers are being considered. They're not always um, from Latino or Spanish speaking. There's other languages as well, although that's the most common um, language difference that we have in our communities. Um, that's not a racial difference, but it certainly creates access challenges, not speaking English. I'm just wanting to hear how we're thinking about this. So I, I would call that an equity dimension. Oh, thank you, Nicole. So um, something like a, a language other than English is definitely part of this mix. Mm -hmm. So that's what part of what we mean by that, that racial equity, however you, you've construed it, you, as you just described it, is an explicit focus, but not an exclusive one. So in, in your case, the, um, the language and cultural dimensions might loom larger for the work that you're doing. Does that help? Kind of. I mean, I don't know. You know, I think this is such a sticky problem. I mean, how to talk about these intersecting inequalities. Um, personally, I have a, a, a bent towards poverty being the one that joins up a lot of the other ones. And um, low income seems to be one of the ways that inequities show up across several of these different categories. I think they're hard categories to work with. Okay. Well, and certainly poverty, um, as you mentioned, is the, um, the designed outcome of a lot of systems and structures. Um, thinking about redlining mm -hmm. for housing and for bank loans and access to educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly, a, a poverty lens or a class lens is, is not mutually exclusive with thinking about this this way. Mm -hmm. I think the, like for me, the key takeaway or the suggestion that key takeaway from, you know, the way it's described in the RFP is um, there, a lot of the work that Nicole and I have been doing over the last, you know, couple of years is trying to build some general um, or shared understanding and shared language around equity and this idea of, you know, that um, really what we're collectively, right, trying to achieve or influence is that there are equitable opportunities to achieve health and well-being in all those eight dimensions, those core conditions, right, the health and wellness, education, economic security, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that those opportunities aren't limited by different Mm -hmm. social characteristics or identities. And so this is um, to provide examples, but it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. So I think that's where in the application, if there are equity dimensions, which is the term that we use as kind of that umbrella term for all of these mm -hmm. that are clearly relevant to your proposal, you know, select those. If there's something that you feel is not quite captured by these, that's what that other option is for and so um, I would I would say and then it's a matter of really I think the proposal is asking applicants to describe tell us about the inequities mm -hmm. that you're seeing within the population that you're trying to reach and serve like what's getting in the way of or what's either um, causing or contributing to the challenges in the first place or disparities in outcomes or you know um absence of health and well-being you know however you're measuring it like tell us like what is it that's that's the barrier and is there some kind of systemic issue that's that's creating or causing that it might be systemic racism it might be you know other forms of oppression 
Um, and so that I think is where, like Nicole is saying, that there's a lot of latitude. And I think that, you know, reviewers will be looking for uh, like a clear description or understanding of, you know, from the applicants about how you're how you're defining those equity dimensions mm -hmm. and the inequities you see and how your services or programs will address that. Thanks. What other questions do you have? I have one around um, the question about where the practice or program um, falls on the continuum of evidence. Great. Um, my colleagues had some questions about that because I believe historically perhaps weight was given to evidence-based practices over emerging practices. And I was curious if that question is designed to, to, to be a little bit less constraining in that. Um, yes. So um, I would just suggest that maybe that was a, um, well, I won't go rehash the past, but the, um, the continuum of evidence and results is actually the subject of a training next week. So um, that would be an opportunity to dig in a little deeper. It's a, a PDF that's available on the um, core segment of the data share, uh, data share platform online, which has a core uh, page under its local progress tab. But basically you're right, the, the, um, the continuum is specifically phrased that way so that it doesn't have that loaded, you know, more evidence is better or an evidence-based program is intrinsically more valuable or, or, or uh, worthwhile to fund. Because the truth is that programs and initiatives are always at different stages of evolution and so it, it's not appropriate to have a rigorous evaluation standard for something that's a new emerging idea or a pilot. Um, so the, the purpose of that question is to ask you to place yourselves on where on a continuum you think you are and then explain why and what kinds of data you think might be interesting to, uh, to collect to learn more about how effective you are in, in your own stated goals, not necessarily superimposed from elsewhere. Or in the case of, for example, as we talked earlier today with the Recovery Cafe team, they have a, a program that has, that happens to be part of a network that where the program has been implemented in other places. And the attempt is to do that more fully here in Santa Cruz County. So the, um, they have access to learning and metrics and ideas from other places that they can bring to bear to the, the um, implementation of their program here. So when there is something in place that gives you those hints about what to look for, um, what's next for a program, what it means to grow a program, and not every program needs or wants to grow is another thing. Mm -hmm. But let's say you have something that you're testing out then you might be at one uh, point on that continuum, but your goal is to test it out with the purpose of expanding it or replicating it more widely. So you're, you might be asking yourselves questions and collecting data and identifying metrics that allow you to do that. Let's say, okay, well now we have a better sense of how this works and why it works. And an important part of that is to be in a learning mode and to, we call this thinking like an evaluator. So it's not that if you don't meet an outcome, it's not necessarily that you have failed, it's that maybe the outcome needs to be reframed somehow, or maybe you didn't have access to the types of information that would tell you whether you're making progress on that particular front. So they're just, um, it's just a way of thinking about where the program is now and where it could be in the future and how you move it from one to the other, if that's what you want to do. Okay, so it's the intention behind it, really. Yeah, um, yeah it's, I think clarity about where your program is. I think. Yeah. And, and I'm not privy to, I've just been in a lot of spaces where there was, there was more constraint around that. 
yeah, from, yeah, from state or whatever. Was, and so um, I just yeah, wanted there's to- a, There's a magnetic pull to some of that, um, mm -hmm. but also some pushback. And so, yeah, and then just, you know, what's, there's lots of philosophical questions about what actually counts as evidence and who gets to okay. decide and all those things. But, okay, helpful, thank you. You're welcome. And, and those trainings will be recorded as well. Oh, and another just, so I've been mentioning the continuum of results and evidence, which I keep calling the continuum of evidence and results. Um, the um, related piece uh, on data share is the promising practices database, which is searchable and is a compendium of what, um, what the Healthy Communities Institute, which is the, the platform host for data share and others have identified as good ideas, emerging practices, um, effective practices and proven practices. So there's some overlap between that and the continuum, but you can, if you are interested in a particular type of program or initiative, you can see what others have done. So Deb, for example, it might be interesting to look at how people talk about resilience programs there, think about some, some outcomes or measures there. It's a great question, Cassie, thank you. Others? Okay, the Recovery Cafe team will be teaching the next session. <laughs> I'm going to say, once we get to the end. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Good trade. So um, we just have a few minutes left. So I just want to see if there's anything anybody wants to ask or add of each other or of us. Or if there are questions you want to put into the chat. Um, here's a question. With... Uh... With the HEAP funding that for the homeless programs a couple of years ago, a lot of agencies got funding, um, but were never able to hire for the programs. How does that kind of idea work? Because there's a question within this application of, you know, does a program have the infrastructure to do the project? But if the infrastructure is also about hiring people, how is that? supposed to balance if that never quite happens um, with also a slight side question of we're supposed to get started on it in July and may not get the funding till August. I don't know. It feels like there's a couple yeah, different yeah. moving parts in, in trying to make yeah, this yeah. happen and not sure how does the, if we don't get the person hired until September, do we not get quite as much funding? What is, how does that work? I think that might be an HSD question. Okay. Can you, Serge, do you mind either submitting that to the HSD email address or putting it in the chat or the Google Docs? We, we, don't, we don't want to be in a position of interpreting anybody's questions. Yeah. Um, so if, if you can just pop that in one of those venues, that would be great. And yeah, that, I'll, that I'll, I'll send the, it to the website. Okay, perfect. And that means that um, when HSD responds, then everybody can see both your question and their answer, which would be great. These are all really good questions. And, you know, as you can tell, we, we are learning a lot of this with you. So thanks for bearing with the process. Before we close out, some of you will be doing this for a second time or even a third time, um, we are interested in your feedback on these types of sessions because we'll be holding more of them and we really do pay attention to this feedback. So please don't skip through the survey. We'll answer your surveys if you answer ours. And 
there's anything else we can either um, try to answer in our last couple minutes, or if there's something you want to um, add to the list of questions to be contemplated or answered elsewhere or later, that would be great too. And it's not the last opportunity to do so. That, that Q&A um, option in particular for anything related to reviewer or the RFP itself um, will go there. And then anything related to the concepts and the core tools can come to us. Deborah? Yeah, just one more question about the promising practices. Is there an expectation that we are going to pick one or more of the ones that are in that database and somehow, no, no they're just there to help stimulate. They're to help, yeah. And it's, it's just tr try to give you some one-stop shopping so you don't have to go to seven different right. clearing houses right. and, and all of that. You, sort of there is an expectation that we will use some kinds of data external to our own agency data. You know, you, you, um, you need to explain in your application what data gives you confidence in your programs and that they work. Mm -hmm. um, it might be something external, it might not be. Okay. You have an opportunity to explain what that is, why it's relevant, how you use it, mm -hmm. what might be missing that you could collect differently or additionally. Um, those, are, those are really, and, and that's another place where you have latitude to tell your story about what's what's meaningful to you and in, in understanding your program and how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Um, can I ask you another question that maybe you don't have an answer to? Um, sure, go for it. Uh, okay, so that my last question that I will send to the website was accountability of if you don't get the staff and you haven't spent the money. What about accountability if you come nowhere, an agency or program doesn't come anywhere near their outcomes that they've promised as time is going on? What's the, how does that work? Is there another conversation with the agency of, hey, we may not keep funding you if you don't do it? Like, what's the structure of that process? Evaluate that, the reports. That's a question for HSD, Serge. Okay. Yeah, because they will handle that. They, they handle the reporting and they receive the reports, they analyze their reports. But it's a, it's a good question. Okay, um, I'll submit that too, thanks. Okay. All right, anything else? Brewing? Yeah, I'm gonna pose the unanswerable, or maybe it is answerable in this group. The Stephen Wright question of, if you're in a car traveling at speed of light and you turn your lights on, will anything happen? That was his suggestion for an, a job interview where they ask you, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> All right, on that note, Getting punchy in the afternoon here. So. <laughs> Welcome and back. I'm just gonna I'm gonna post the link to that Google Sheet oh, where you can you. sign up for the one-on-one -on -one TA sessions. Um, again, one per application. So if you find as you get further into this process, <clears throat> and especially if you're doing more than one application and and you want to get some more individualized assistance, then you can uh, sign up for a slot in a, in the Google Sheet, and then either Nicole or I will send a calendar invite to you. So that's one also where you could like, um, you know, have a few of you attend together. It doesn't necessarily have to mean one person to, but it's just, you know, a little bit more individualized compared to these office hours sessions. That was actually my question um, about um, effectively utilizing that time. Um, do you recommend obviously getting a little further into it? So we're coming in with really specific questions as we're kind of teasing these things through. Um, is it, would it be more useful to kind of have it one-on-one -on -one and more focused, or are you guys comfortable having a number of people? If there's like a team working on a grant together, if there's a handful, a of team is great. Um, Serge and Ken are meeting with us that way. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. It's up to you. Okay. And um, and then we also. Um, really suggest if you have a chance to look at any of the um, the, the recorded uh, trainings, if it's something specific, if you haven't had a chance to look at, for example, the overview of the core conditions or how to do a theory of change or logic model, and that feels relevant to your question, it would be great 
if you had a chance to view that before. Okay, we've actually broken them up as a team. So I attended the project model one. So between us, we should have them covered. Excellent. That's great. Love that strategy. Yeah, divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. I think that's it. We will see you at one upcoming event or another. Good luck to all of you. And thank you for being with us this afternoon and some of you most of the day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you Bye, soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys.